cap and gown? Yeah. Yes. Say yeah. that. All right. So calorimetry, by definition, is the measurement of heat production. So when we burn something, how much heat is re 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 released? And what we're looking at really is that oxidation re reduction process at the cellular level, and it's indirect because we're measuring it. True direct calor calorimetry, we would have to set you on fire and measure how much heat is produced, which obviously is not very productive yeah. for the patient long-term wise. Um, Lavoisier, my friend, French Revolution, uh, coined the term caloric. Um, you don't need to know these, by the way, guys. Just kind of background. Um, Liebig was the first one to look at the fact that there's three primary substrates that we have that we burn for fuel. Uh, Joule was the uh, defined the units of energy, and we still use his name as a measurement of energy. Specifically, we talk about um, electrical current passing through. In the case of cardioversion defibrillation, we <coughs> quantify that in joules. And then we came to the eventual common knowledge that as we use either of those three substrates along with oxygen, we, we, we produce not only carbon dioxide and water, but also some degree of energy. And they burn at different rates, as, as we will see. Um, the amount of carbon dioxide that is burned depends upon what we're talking about. In the case of glucose or starch, it's basically a one-to-one. -one. So for every one milliliter of oxygen that is consumed, one milliliter of, of carbon dioxide is produced, yielding an RQ of 1.0. Fats, on the other hand, are on, a, are on the low end, somewhere in the order of about 0.7. So a high-fat diet is going to produce less carbon dioxide than a high carb diet. Protein's a little bit in the middle um, because it differs in how it's actually me metabolized, but somewhere around 0.82, all of them together in a normal balanced diet uh, comes out to a respiratory exchange ratio of about 0.8. Respiratory exchange ratio is what we actually measure at the airway. The assumption is that it's the same as what goes on at the cellular level, which is the respiratory quotient. Um, you should have an idea as far as the difference between how much carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, how much calories are created when you have a gram of carbohydrate consumed. You produce four kilocalories. Protein, four kilo, about four kilocalories also. And fat would yield about nine. And as I always say, just for completeness, alcohol is an RQ of about 0 0.7. 0 0.67 it generates seven kilocalories per gram because... We have to include alcohol and all of our things. So we should know the numbers. Yes. Oh. And why? It's because you can look at something like this, where you end up having so many carbohydrates, so many grams of fat, so many grams of protein, figuring out how many kilocalories they generate, adding them together, and we end up getting our 250 calories that are, that are there. So that's how that is derived. And again, this is assuming one one serving size, which of course is always ridiculous. It's like you look at a bag of chips and you see, you know, three chips. Yep. Who's gonna eat three? Uh, what we do though at the bedside is we use indirect calorimetry to evaluate how much oxygen is being consumed, CO2 is being produced, and how many calories are being burned. Um, CO2 production is basically just looking at how much CO2 is being inspired, how much CO2 is being exhaled, and then comparing that with the minute ventilation. So the amount of volume that is exhaled times the exhaled concentration, how much is inspired times the inspired concentration, which should be zero, and we can end up deriving what the CO2 production is. Similarly, we can look at the oxygen consumption by looking at how much is inspired and how much is exhaled. And from that, we can go ahead and uh, derive that. We also measure minute ventilation. And there is a little bit of fudge that is done on the oxygen consumption, um, something called the Haldane transformation. That we'll just, we'll just assume that, that's, as, that this formula is, is sufficient. Now, you, will, you will never calculate this at the bedside 
But if you're in an institution that does do indirect calorimetry, the machine does, does this all for you. No. But if you think about it, if I wanted to measure how much oxygen was consumed, if I know how much is going in and I know how much is coming back out, the difference between them is how much is being utilized. Obviously, you need a high-end um, oxygen an analyzer that can analyze very rapidly because you've got such a small time frame that you're working with. Um, and the difference between the FiO2 and the FeO2 is not very large. Normal, breathing room, room air, you have a 21% inspired, exhaled 16, 17%, so you only got a 4 or 5% difference. You need a pretty, pretty high end um, oxygen analyzer. Um, and it has to be a stable source. Uh, the ventilators nowadays have very stable FiO2s, earlier generation <coughs> ventilators, obviously. You could have them set at 40 and they would fluctuate all, 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 all around there. CO2 is measured with an uh, infrared analyzer. That's your typical CO2 analyzer, your capnography. And then we're going to measure the volume using some sort of a pneumatac or flow meter. You guys are familiar with those from last semester. We talked about the turbine and the ultrasonic vortex flow meters and the conversion there from ATPS to BTPS. This is kind of a schematic internally. Why I put that up there, I don't know. You guys aren't going to remember this. It basically is the ability to uh, mix the gas thoroughly, which is very important, sample it, measure the O2, measure the CO2, measure the volume. These are some of the systems that you have. You can see here I have a patient who has a hood or a, or a, like a space suit around them so that they're, it's a tight seal. Um, here the person on the bike is being uh, monitored uh, with a mask system. And it's just a matter of sampling the, the two gases. Some of the things to keep in mind about it, um, there is the ability to uh, have a stable FiO2. We talked about that. Um, we talked about the high FiO2s, this Haldane transformation. Most cases we're dealing with patients in a relatively low FiO2, either room air or if they're on a mechanical ventilator, we're typically not looking at a high FiO2s. High levels of PEEP can make a difference because of the positive pressure on the analyzers. Um, water vapor leaks are probably the biggest source of error because the minute your 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 volume is lost, all the all the calculations get 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 thrown off. And the degree to which these are portable to be able to roll to the bedside um, is a consideration also. What do we do with this? Well, we basically are able to measure what is called the resting energy expenditure, the REE. And this is a value that tells you how much caloric um, intake the patient needs. So if I can find out how much calories they actually need, I can get an idea of how much I have to go ahead and replenish them. Without indirect calorimetry, the best you can do is use basically some equations in that Harris-Benedict <coughs> using height and weight, um, you're able to predict what the uh, um, energy expenditure should, should, should be. Another formula is the DeWeer. De um, the problem is that that's, a pre that's based upon a normal individual. You get somebody in the ICU who is under stress, who um, has altered metabolic processes, those numbers are useless in a, in, a, in a lot of ways. That's why we, we want to end up measuring what their actual energy expenditure is so I know how to refeed them in the process. If you collect over 24 hours what we call a UUN, not a BUN, this is a urine urea nitrogen, and measure the actual amount of urea that is present in the, in the um, urine, you can then go ahead and actually not only get how much energy is expended, but what percentage of the energy is being burned is fat, protein, and carbohydrate. This becomes important when you got somebody like a burn patient who you know has a hypermetabolic state, but you want to be able to quantify how much protein is being lost so I can replenish with protein in their diet. Okay. 
Um, and the bottom line is that it, you need a steady state condition. This is one where you actually hook the patient up to the indirect calorimeter. We put the lights down low. We measure them at a resting state. Don't disturb them. It takes about 20, 30 minutes to get a stable reading. From that point, then you can go ahead and uh, derive your, 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 your uh, values. And this is actually out of pill beam if you really want to look at it further. So increased CO2 production is obviously something where you're in a hypermetabolic state, you're producing more CO2. We also see this just from overfeeding. Not using just a standardized diet can often lead to situations where patients are being fed more calories than they need. And that can actually be harmful, especially if you're putting too much CO2 into the system by feeding them too high of a carbohydrate diet and if they can't um, ventilate that off, you end up worsening an acidotic state. Reduced uh, CO2 production would be kind of the opposite. Um, star 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 starvation um, or a hypometabolic state can lead to that. Elevated uh, O2 Con con consumption. Most of this should not come as any surprise. We kind of talked about this previously when we were talking about hemodynamic states. Um, shivering, exercise, burns, and a reduction in oxygen cons consumption would be some of those things that are listed there. Um, not that I would ever test you on this, but there are three phases of uh, stress um, initially, you get a little bit of uh, reduction in metabolic rate as the hemodynamics are kind of unstable. And there's some insulin resistance that goes on. Then over the next week, you end up having a hyperketabolic state. Uh, you're breaking down um, fats and proteins for sugar. And um, finally, you end up having, if this goes on for a long period of time, an anabolic state where you actually have some rebuilding that, that goes on. That REE is going to vary, as I mentioned, based upon stress. Um, so you need to account for uh, in the initial phase, at least the stress on the catabolic, you need to feed at about 100% uh, of their REE once you get to that rebuilding phase, that anabolic stage, you actually want to overfeed them because, especially with proteins, because they're, they're basically re rebuilding body mass. And we can go ahead and um, either using these predicted values, this is where the problem comes up, is they're saying, well, you know, we really don't know how much energy expenditure they are using. Let's just say it's 10% uh, more than what they're predicted would end up being. Well, it's kind of a, a bad way of approaching it is just use this, the, uh, the swag method. More appropriately would be to measure the actual values though, as far as what their RE is. And this is just talking about looking at the respiratory quotient under normal conditions. Most critically ill patients are somewhere between 0.85 and 0.9, so a little bit higher than the normal RQ of 0.8. When you get values that are outside of that range of 0.6 to 1.3, something's goofy, you shouldn't be that way. Greater than 1.0 probably means you're overfeeding them. And in the case of a COPD patient, that's detrimental. Uh, 0.9 to 1 means that you're probably replenishing carbohydrates at the right rate. Um, 0.8 to 0.9 is the target range that you want to be in. In that lower range, you would end up having where you have a lot of fat and protein metabolism rather than carbohydrates. Patients that are at a high risk for malnourishment, uh, which is going to lead to problems with them being able to do met normal metabolic activity. Some of the examples there, you can see um, patients that are underweight or anorexic, patients that have GI issues. Uh, the ones we typically come across are the patients in hypermetabolic state, patients in septic shock, patients who are trauma patients, burn patients. Those are ones that are the really 
really lead to a, a problem of, of uh, impaired um, metabolic states and starvation. Um, not that I expect you to know this, but basically proteins are only taken in through dietary intake um, and um, protein loss um, can be detrimental in the sense that it affects pretty much any, any muscle uh, function. We know that when, it, when uh, you have an increased need for um, energy, the liver go, goes ahead and converts glycogen to glucose. Any fats are, uh, are then uh, mobilized and brought back to the liver where you end up having um, them broken down for, again, glucose to be utilized. And once fats are depleted, the only thing you got left are skeletal muscles, and that basically is where you end up with a lot of protein loss. There's two types. I love these two words. Marasmus and quashicorcor. One is a starvation, one is a hypercatabolic state. So these are an example of marasmus. And quashiorcor is where they have the large belly. So even though they're being mal even this child is mal 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 malnourished, their abdomen swells. Marasmus and quashiorcor. Um, we don't really look at micronutrients, but they are important. Some of the minerals like magnesium and uh, phosphate are necessary for normal uh, muscle function. Um, in any balanced diet, we have no problems attaining these patients in the ICU, though. Different story. They're often not um, adequately replenished or they, they don't have the ability to have the intake, so we have to uh, add them to a uh, uh, hyperalimentation system. And this is the situation in COPD, this worsening cycle of um, they don't eat, eat properly, their um, metabolic rate is increased, their CO2 production is increased, and it basically just goes in this chronic cycle. Thank you for closing the door. Uh, what do I want you to know here? Not much. Problems with uh, protein intake is if, if it's excessive, it can end up having um, an increase in um, urea in the blood, what we call azotemia. That was one of the big problems with the um, Atkins diet, which was high in protein, uh, was it uh, could lead to a metabolic acidosis due to, due to re renal failure. Carbohydrates, um, again, biggest problem there, if you have too big of a load, that could be having problems where patients have an inability to adequately be removed from mechanical ventilation in the face of chronic CO, CO, CO2 with the re re retention. And fats. Um, can end up leading to problems also because you end up well, with some reducing oxygen uh, transfer. How about bronchoscopy? It's got a love knitter. It's a, that's a great term. But how about a video first? When I told the folks back home that I was coming to Akhtar Mahdi, they said, where the fox hat? <laughs> where the fox hat? Okay. Let's talk about bronchoscopy. Um, again, it's the ability to place a scope into the airways. Multiple reasons why we might want to do this. Just simple um, inspection to see um, where there might, might, might be some damage. Uh, say a patient who's prolonged intubation, what, uh, what's, what state of their vocal cords are, are, are in, what does their trachea look like, et cetera, et cetera. We use it to remove objects from the, from the airway, somebody who aspirates something. Um, if they can't clear it on their own for a normal cough me me mechanism, 
uh, may, may be required to go in and, and pull it out. We use it often to collect tissue samples, especially for biopsies, for identification of um, different types of cancers. And they're also used now to place things like interbronchial stents to, main, to maintain pa patency. Some of the indications that are also there is this from the AARC clinical practice guidelines. Um, something where we have an, a lesion on an x-ray that we want to be able to, to identify. Um, so that's the patency or, uh, of the upper airway. Investigate why the person perhaps has some of these. What is this? Strider with an E? Who'd help spell check this? Apparently I did not. Uh, it should be a strider. But what's some of these causes? Look for uh, sputum cytology. It's the best way to get a, a sample is through, through bronchoscopy so it's direct. And biopsies we talked about. And uh, if you're looking at a, something where the aspirator had a toxic inhalation, how much damage is present. There's some more. Um, you can actually use bronchoscopy on a patient who has a difficult airway to be able to, you can actually have the tube slide over the bronchoscope and it's much easier to visualize and place that tube for some, some, some patients who have a difficult airway. Removal of mucus plugs. Yeah. Contraindications, um, really they're Somebody who doesn't know what they're doing should not be operating a bronchoscope. It's kind of a no no brainer there. Um, but an inability to adequately ventilate and oxygenate the patient uh, would be a, an absolute contra contraindication. And some of the other relative contraindications, things like coagulopathies, severe obstructive disease, severe refractory hypoxemia. Got to, got to weigh the benefit um, versus the risk and some more relative contraindications. Most of them are pretty pretty obvious. Some of the complications, um, usually we prep the patient with some medications so there's always the risk that they'd be having an, have an allergic reaction or an adverse reaction to that medication. You're obviously applying vacuum directly to the airway, so the risk of hypoxemia and hypercarbia from, from obstruction is always there. Uh, laryngospasm and uh, other vagally mediated, you have a lot of vagal receptors at the location of the carina. Um, death would probably be a risk that you probably should take into account. Um, and, um, an infection hazard for us also. Potentially the patient has tuberculosis were a direct contamination there. Two types of bronchoscopy you should be aware of. One is called a flexible. That's the one that we most commonly see. That's what this one is here. But there's also what is called a rigid bron bronchoscope. The rigid bronchoscope you can see here is not flexible. It's rigid. It's just based on a metal tube. And with proper positioning, the um, bronchoscope is inserted. It can only go down to about the, um, uh, the through the trachea to the main stem. Can't even go beyond that point in time. But if you have an aspirated object, it's easier to get it out with this one because it's a much larger inner channel that is involved. And you can see there are specialized forceps that as you open and close like a scissor, you open and close the little distal tip, which is like an alligator. So I can go ahead and slide that down through the rigid bronchoscope, down into the upper airway to be able to grasp whatever is aspirated and pull it back out again. And this is not something you could do on a conscious patient by any stretch. Um, this is typically done in the OR. More commonly, we have a flexible bronchoscope. The flexible bron bronchoscope has a couple of different functions. First of all, there's a little lever that is here that as you move that up or down, you move the tip one way or the other. So that's the way the, as the bronchoscope, bronchoscopist, 
bronchoscopist, thank you, um, goes down, he comes to the right and left main stem bronchi, he can direct the scope one way or the other in the process. There's also a um, light source that is there, and basically what this, what is all through here are um, uh, fiber optic, uh, uh, fiber optic, what I want to use. It's like a series of mirrors that go down so that whatever you're viewing here is whatever is coming out here. Um, so there's a viewing channel, there's lighting that is there that uh, illuminates the airway, and then there is a channel that you can put other things through like those biopsy forceps. Is this a great video? I don't know if it did, it didn't work or not, it's a little gift that you're moving down. But you can see some of the different things that you can end up visualizing as you're viewing it. Okay. There actually is, and I would never expect anybody to know this, um, there actually is a way that they can outline each specific bronchi, bronchiole, etc. as you go as you go down. First of all, there's a right and a left. Then there is a, a segmental designation. Then there's a small case letter for subsegmental, Roman numeral for fifth order bronchi. So you can actually say RB10BII, which designates to the fifth of the two fifth order bronchi arising from the second of three divisions of the posterior basal segment bronchi center. Sure, dude, whatever you say. But this way, the, the person who is doing the bronchoscopy can outline where he sees the defect at with some uh, greater precision. I think that, that it's just plain insanity. Right and left was enough for me. So there's four uh, things we need to be aware of uh, as far as the pre-process, the equipment preparation, the airway preparation, and then monitoring during the procedure. This is where we would be involved. Um, there are some institutions where the respiratory therapist is still responsible for administration of, of medications pre. Um, there's nothing in our licensure that prevents us from administering things like Valium or fentanyl. Um, in many institutions, the, um, there would be a nurse who would be there to administer the, med the medication. We also would want to uh, dry out any secretions so they're pre-treated with some atropine. Um, atropine being a, a, a anticholinergic suppresses the, the development of uh, mucus so you end up having a, a, a drying out of the patient's airway. It would be nice to have some personal protection gear on. Um, always want to have airway management tools available, suction with appropriate catheters, lots of different um, needles and syringes. The syringes need to be both the lure, lure lock style. Oh, it's, it should be L-O-C-K, shouldn't it? Okay. And the slip fit tips, you're, you're, you're familiar with each of those designs, correct? Yes. Um, both uh, sharp tip needles and actually blunt tip needles. Blunt tip would basically be where there's got a beveled end to it. It's just a straight in, um, which is used to draw up a lot of medications with. Some normal saline, some non-bacteria static saline, sharps container obviously. And then you have all kind of different equipment that you need to be able to do different things with. Here's an example. These are some of the, some, some of the forceps. We're going to have different types of brushes I'll talk about, retrieval baskets, um, some sort of a specimen cup or Lucan's trap that you end up having. Does anybody know what this is called? What type of suction system this is? It's called a delay suction. Anybody ever seen one of, one of these? I used to use them in the labor and delivery all the time. This one portion, this one tube here, goes into the patient's, the baby's mouth. Guess where this end goes? In your mouth. You're the source of vacuum. Ew! 
We're going to also have some other stuff to, um, one, once we get a, um, a sampling, we want to put it in, in formalin to be able to um, keep it so it doesn't uh, deteriorate until we get down to pathology. And there's also some fixative we put for some of the solutions. Here's the biopsy forcep. You can see it's got a little, small little knife. And as they, on the very end of it here, there's a, there's a, um, a ring that as you pull back, this will actually slice into the tissue and be able to um, catch it. Now, this is where we come into play because the, the physician's got one hand on the bronchoscope, one hand on putting, sliding this down. Somebody's got to pull back on that other end of it. And that's where we come in. So, yank a little, or this, in, in this case, you're actually slicing some of the tissue away. These are called alligator forceps for obvious reasons. And you basically literally grab onto a piece of tissue and sample it. Here's some brushes. You can see that this one here is recessed out of this encasing here so that you're able to brush something and then as you retract it back it gets pulled back in so there's not contamination from the uh, as, as you're pulling it back out. And this is uh, for cytology for actual um, uh, sampling of uh, some tissue. Retrieval baskets for uh, something that might be aspirated that's further down like a rigid bronchoscope couldn't be able to access. Um, you actually can go ahead and slide this around it and as you pull back on the, on the, on the portion here, it closes the basket down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Monitoring is obvious stuff. Pulse oximetry um, and tidal CO2 could also be put on that list. Um, EKG. Obviously, we want to have all kind of other stuff there that we would want to do. Various medications. The one that you should be uh, aware of: epinephrine for bleeding. Um, I've seen acetylcysteine directly instilled through a bronchoscope for mucus plugging. Uh, cetacane is an anesthetic, topical anesthetic that is often used for the back of the throat. Anybody know what romazicot is? It's an antidote for Versed, overdose Versed. Romazicot is the way you treat it. Naloxone better known as Narcan for an overdose of opiates like morphine. Probably have never heard of this drug before. Yeah, but those are typically on the card also. So we want to basically prep the airway so that we don't have a lot of coughing and gagging, especially in a patient who's conscious. Um, we can sedate them to some extent, but it's often beneficial to have them so that they are able to respond to you. We'll use some of that typical topical anesthetic like cetacaine or uh, lidocaine administered with an atomizer, so it just numbs the back of the throat. Uh, we talked about epinephrine being there, and if there's any pain management, uh, certainly morphine can take care of that. This is one instance where you want to have the tone on the pulse oximeter turned on so you actually can hear it desaturate. Um, and again, we'll spend a lot of time going through dys dysrhythmia recognition and uh, appropriate treatment uh, when we get to the EKG part of the course. And really a good assistant anticipates when what's going to be needed next and it makes it a whole lot easier for the, for the doc. And that's it.